Good morning. I'm Debbie Herzman, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm joined today by our investigator in charge, Mr. Robert Aceta. I'd like to provide you with a little update on our investigative activity since yesterday afternoon. First, I'd like to take the opportunity to provide you with some information about the bridge itself. There's been a lot of discussion about the height of the bridge at various points. As I stated yesterday, we're going to talk about the bridge. It's an elliptical bridge, and you can see that it's higher in the center than it is on the two corners. The lowest point of the bridge is over here, close to the median or to the uh, barrier on the shoulder. That's 14 and a half feet, 14 feet six inches. The fog line is the white line on the roadway at the edge of the right-hand travel lane. The measurement there is estimated at 15 and a half feet. And then in the center of the bridge from the yellow line, the height is approximately 18 feet. Is this somebody's? You can hear the radio. Yeah, turn it off. Just okay. hit the end. The authorized speed on this section of roadway is 60 miles per hour. Our team has looked back at the last 10 years of inspection records, and from that we can tell that this bridge has a history of over-height vehicle hits. The last documented hit from an over-height vehicle occurred on October 22nd, 2012 and it occurred in the four, first portal frame of the northbound lane. And in fact, and Peter, if you wouldn't mind putting that back up, um, as it, just to orient you, we're looking north. This is the lane that the vehicle uh, was, the accident vehicle was traveling in. And this section here is where that hit occurred. And you can see a small gouge in that picture. That is where that October 22nd hit occurred uh, from last year. You can see for, with the naked eye, uh, visible damage and the deformed metal of the first frame and subsequent frames along the bridge. Again, this is from that last hit um, last year. But as you walk the bridge, you can see visible damage on other spans that are not so recent. Our team is in obtaining inspection records going back further, and we will continue to look into the history of the bridge. Mullen Trucking, the company that operated the accident vehicle, was issued an oversize permit on May 23rd, and it expired on May 25th. That permit is issued by the Washington State Department of Transportation. The load listed to be carried is an open-sided casing shed, which weighed 40,000 pounds. The total gross vehicle weight was 88,000 pounds. I'm sorry. The vehicle weighed 40,000 pounds. I'm sorry, the open casing shed weighed 40,000 pounds and the gross, total gross vehicle weight was 88,000 pounds. The vehicle was over 14 feet high and wider than the eight feet six inches that are legal. And so if a vehicle is over 14 feet high and wider than eight feet six inches, it must obtain a permit that allows the operator to exceed the sta established limits on the roadways that are designated. For this load, the permit authorized the operator to carry a load that was 11 feet 6 inches in width, 15 feet 9 inches for the height, and 70 feet 4 inches for the trailer load length. 
As part of the permitting process, the operator provides to the state its planned route for the permit. The routing information is included as an attachment to the final approved permit document. The final approved form states that Washington DOT does not guarantee height clearances and that the oversized signs are required for the vehicle. The accident load was destined for Vancouver, Washington, and the accident occurred in the southbound lane at milepost 228.5. Again, as we've relayed previously in prior briefings, both the pilot vehicle and the accident truck were traveling in the right lane of the southbound lanes, according to interviews from the driver and also uh, information that's been documented at the accident site. Again, the section of the permit uh, that identifies routing on I-5 in this, in this section of the route states that Washington DOT does not guarantee height clearances. Washington State regulations have different requirements for the use of pilot vehicles. I know this came up yesterday in our briefing. There were some questions about this. There are different requirements based on different load widths and lengths and heights. For example, there are different requirements for loads that exceed 11 feet wide, 14 feet wide, and 20 feet wide. And depending on the type of roadway that is to be traveled, the regulation dictates the use of one or more pilot vehicles. Because the accident vehicle load was 11 feet 6 inches wide, it was required to have two pilot vehicles one lead and one trail on two lane roads. Because the accident vehicle load exceeded the height restrictions, it was required to use a lead pilot vehicle equipped with a height measuring device, like a pole, on all state highways and roads. The operator of the pilot vehicle must be certified to operate in the state of Washington and must be certified as having received state DOT approved base level training as a pilot vehicle operator. Our investigators are reviewing the compliance with all of the permit routing requirements. The motor carrier group chairman that works for the NTSB has already traveled to Alberta, Canada to the operator's place of business he will be reviewing records, meeting with company management officials, and discussing policies and procedures for the transportation of oversized loads. We have requested that drug and alcohol testing be conducted with, consistent with NTSB procedures, and we've also requested cell phone records from both the truck driver and the pilot car operator. In addition, we will be conducting a 72-hour look back or a 72-hour work rest history for the drivers and evaluating any medical or other factors that may have had an impact on performance. All of these uh, efforts that we're undertaking are standard procedure in NTSB investigations to fully document and record the circumstances. We have secured the truck driver's logbook and a preliminary review of records shows that he went on duty at 9 a.m. on the day of the accident. He met the driver of the pilot car, and the pilot car is actually a Dodge Ram pickup truck. He met them at 5.30 at the Canadian border, 5.30 p.m. at the Canadian border. Washington State Patrol reported to us that following the bridge collapse, the pilot car had a height pole and it was mounted in a permanent bracket on the, back, on the right portion of the vehicle. We're working now to set up interviews of the pilot car driver, of the occupants of the two vehicles that were on the bridge, as well as any witnesses that were either on or in the vicinity of the bridge at the time of the collapse. 
We know that there are multiple videos that captured the, either the preceding events or the collapse sequence, and we're working with the State Patrol to obtain all of those videos so that we can analyze them and we can use them to corroborate witness statements and other evidence that we've gathered. A commercial vehicle inspection has been conducted of the tractor trailer, and that was done on the eve of the accident by the Washington State Patrol. We have now <coughs> moved the vehicle to a secure location where it is on a flat surface rather than on an incline as it was on the approach span, where our additional inspections and measurements are being conducted <coughs> by our investigator. Our team also gathered measurements of the accident truck, the trailer, and the load, that shed that we're talking about. However, however due to post-impact damage, the measurements are inconsistent because of the buckling of the load and some shifting on the trailer. For that reason, we have ex secured a separate <coughs> exemplar vehicle, which is being held about 10 miles north of the bridge at a way station. It has the same uh, shed. It's a twin of the one that was being carried on this truck. And so we'll be comparing the measurements taken of that undamaged trailer and its load with the damaged trailer and load to uh, con confirm pre and post impact measurements. The accident reconstruction team was working on the bridge all day yesterday. They have completed a 3D laser scan of the remaining bridge structure and they're now beginning to scan the truck tractor and the trailer load as well as the exemplar trailer and they'll be looking to do the same thing with the pilot car as well. In addition, uh, there was evidence that was gathered from the roadway on the night of the accident. It included strips of metal, straps, buckles, and bolts. There are also tire marks on the roadway that have been documented and photographed. These tire marks are characterized as skip skids, which indicate that following the initial impact with the bridge, that the trailer may have experienced lateral rocking or bouncing. This corresponds to evidence that our investigators found on the trailer. For example, there are tire marks on the inside of the wheel wells on the driver's side of the trailer, which shows that the tires were compressed and engaging at the top of the wheel well, preventing them from rolling. This means that the force of the impact likely shifted the load to the driver's side of the vehicle. In addition, we found that the chain tie downs used to secure the load to the trailer remained intact everywhere except for that front right corner of the load where the chain was broken. Today, investigative teams will continue to verify all of the measurements on the bridge structure. They'll be conducting additional inspection of the truck and the trailer. And working very closely with Washington DOT, we will be monitoring and coordinating the removal of the damaged superstructure from the bridge, I mean, from the river. As I said earlier, our human performance investigators are trying to contact the pilot and other witnesses to conduct those interviews. The party members to our investigation are the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, Washington State DOT, Washington State Patrol, and Mullen Trucking. I was out on the scene this morning, and as many of you are aware, you've probably seen pictures of the barge and crane that's there. A lot of equipment is being pre-positioned and they're waiting for some additional equipment to be brought in to start the removal of the dropped span of the bridge. And so that is the work that really is going to be uh, focused uh, on by DOT as well as some of our investigators. We've mentioned in previous briefings that are, there are certain portions of the dropped bridge span that we're very interested in particularly U5, U4, that section of the bridge is underwater 
and we are very interested in seeing that when it is brought up. As we uh, mentioned in our press release, this will be our last on-scene press briefing, but our team's work here continues. As I mentioned, we're going to have investigators traveling to other parts of the country and Canada to conduct interviews with uh, remaining witnesses and organizations. We will continue to release factual information as appropriate, and we will do that via press release. Uh, from our Washington office, and we expect to issue a preliminary report within the next 30 days. Future updates uh, will be available. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at, at NTSB. Um, our website is www.ntsb.gov. And Peter, who's here, and Kelly uh, have been working with you all. You can continue to stay in touch with them for additional updates. With that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Yes, ma'am. My name is Kate Martin. I'm with the Skagit Valley Herald. You said this bridge has a history of over high collisions and that your agency has looked at the past 10 years of records. Could you give us any indication as to how many collisions may have happened in the past? The question is how many over height collisions may have happened in the past. I mentioned that we've reviewed records uh, from approximately the last 10 years. I think we need to look back and make sure all those records are complete. Uh, we do know that there are a number of over height strikes. Some of them may or may not be reported. Some may be identified in bridge inspections that take place uh, where they're documented. And so we have got to pull together a lot of different records, both from WASH DOT and the State Patrol to identify a comprehensive list. But we will certainly be focusing on that in the coming days and we will provide more information. Yes, sir. Um, Derek Long with KOW Radio. If the driver was in the left lane, could he have made it across without striking the bridge? The question is, if the driver was in the left lane, could he have made it across without striking the bridge? I think that's very uh, uh, much the focus of our investigation. We know that the company was required to establish that there were uh, that they could clear uh, the entire route. That was one of the expectations for providing them that over height permit. We also know that the height of the bridge is variable. You saw on the outer edges, um, it's several feet shorter than it is towards the center of the span. And so we know that this permit was issued for 15 feet, 9 inches, and we know towards the center of the bridge, this, the clearance is significantly higher than on the right sides. And so um, if this vehicle had been traveling in the left lane, we likely would not have seen uh, the bridge strikes that we saw, but we need to take measurements all the way through at all the frames. Um, and so clearly we, we have an issue that we need to take a look at here, but I think a very straightforward uh, look at this demonstrates that the clearance in the left lane is much higher than the clearance in the right lane. Jim, yes, ma'am. With the Seattle Times, do you have an exact <coughs> origin and destination for the truck? The question is, do we have an exact origin and destination for the truck? Uh, we're still working uh, to establish origin. We know that this driver um, likely began his day at about 9, but we want to check and see where the cargo was loaded, who loaded it, uh, who secured it. And we do know that it was ultimately destined, the casing shed was ultimately destined for Alaska for um, some drilling operations. It was scheduled as far as the destination of the truck to be traveling, they were again traveling from Canada southbound to Vancouver, Washington, where that, case, where that shed was going to be loaded on a barge and then transported up to Alaska. We do need to compile some additional information about the front end of the trip. Yes, sir. Hi. Yesterday. Could you identify yourself, uh, my please? My name is Jerry, Jerry okay. Healy, and um, I'm a truck driver. Okay. And yesterday I was at the meeting and you had said that you would talk to the pilot car and that they, the lady that was driving there, they claimed that she, her high pole did not hit the bridge. <clears throat> I have, which I handed to Robert, an eyewitness account of the truck that actually passed the oversized road and he claims he was 50 feet in front of the truck, in between the truck and the uh, pilot car. He witnessed the antenna hitting the bridge, and at that time said there's going to be a problem, looked in his rear view mirror, and at that time saw the truck hit the bridge, and then saw the bridge collapse behind the truck. He called Channel 5 News, 
that evening, an hour after it happened, and it was all over Channel 5. Nobody's mentioned that. And when I <clears throat> inquired yesterday as to if you detained the truck, why didn't you detain, or why didn't Washington State Patrol detain the pilot vehicle, as that was part of the whole Sure. Do you have a question in here? Um, yeah. I wanted to know why, um, there, first of all, the pilot car vehicle and why there was no rear pilot car vehicle. Okay. The, qu um, the question is why there was no pilot car vehicle? For the rear. Okay. The question is why there was no pilot car vehicle for the rear. Um, in, earlier in the briefing, I mentioned that we have reviewed the pilot car regulations. There are requirements for vehicles that are over 11 feet wide to have two escort or pilot car vehicles on two lane roads. We understand that this vehicle did traverse some of those roads and that there were two vehicles with it when it was on the two lane roads. It is not required to have a trail vehicle when it is on a multi-lane or four-lane road per the pilot car regulations. It is required to have a lead car because of the height restrictions. This vehicle, again, was over height. It is required to have a lead car with a pilot driver and a pole, a measuring pole. The, the state police did detain the pilot car driver after the event. They interviewed her. They documented uh, the vehicle and they took some measurements. We have that information. We have been reaching out to the pilot car driver to try to, one, conduct an interview with her, and two, examine the vehicle and the pole. We are interested in scanning the vehicle and measuring the pole to understand what happened. Yesterday I was asked a question about some witness interviews, particularly interviews that saw the pilot car's pole wagging when it traversed the bridge. It would be very helpful um, to get additional interviews. We have mentioned that we're interested in interviewing other witnesses. We have a gentleman here who's identified that, there, that he knows and he's heard from a truck driver who's on the bridge and we will get that contact information from him so we can interview that driver. Again, there are a lot of statements that are going to be put out there. Some of those statements might be conflicting. That is not unusual in our investigations. Uh, to have conflicting witness statements. People see different things from different vantage points. We are going to work to corroborate all of those interviews that are conducted with the video evidence, and we have several different videos that capture shots from different angles and different locations. We'll work to corroborate all of that in our final report. Can we take one more from the media? Yes, sir. Um, may I make a, can I get a factual clarification? from uh, one of the PIOs afterwards. Sure. Okay, um, a subjective question that I think is important uh, for the public to, to, to hear and the answer. Why is it that you're spending this much time uh, providing so much detail, making it public, being very forthcoming? Why is it so important for the safety of the public for you to provide all this information and to come up with the final answer as to why? Sure. The question is, why uh, is the NTSB uh, providing so much information in such a transparent way, and why is that important to the public? The NTSB is an independent investigatory agency charged with uh, looking at accidents in all modes of transportation. We have a statutory requirement to investigate all civil aviation accidents, and then we investigate accidents on the highways, on the rails, marine, pipelines. When we uh, investigate an accident, we believe it's very important to show our work, to share with the public what we are finding, because there is a lot of information out there that may not be accurate. It's important for us to put the facts out, particularly when it's a very high profile event. And in some cases where lives have been lost, in this case we're very thankful we didn't have a loss of life but we lost a very important transportation artery in this part of the country and it is certainly important to this community. At the end of the day, why we are here is to figure out what happened, why it happened, and to 
issue recommendations to prevent it from happening again. If we can do that, if by our work here in investigating this event, we can prevent a future bridge collapse, then the cost of our work, our, our travel here, will be paid for a thousand times over, uh, certainly for the community and for the information that's out there. I think just having the very discussions that we're having and making them public about the circumstances of this accident help all drivers to be aware of things. They certainly help commercial drivers to be aware of things. And I think it helps policymakers to be aware of the, of the issues that are present in this investigation. If changes need to be made, then the public has the information to support those and the policymakers have information to support those. And by being transparent, we are allowing everyone to evaluate for themselves uh, what they think the important issues are here. Thank you all very much for your, uh, for your courtesy and uh, for uh, hosting us here. And we look forward to providing you more information from our team that will continue to work on scene. Have a good day.